The story of John List. This story is about one of America's most wanted criminals. For 18 long years, the police searched from coast to coast to find this man. During this time, he led a full life and managed to come out on top in his game of cat and mouse with the FBI. So what did he do that was so terrible, and how did he manage to evade the authorities? The List family lived in a large house in Westfield, New Jersey. The head of the family, John List, had a senior role in a bank. Money was no issue for him. He also had a happy family life. 20 years of marriage with his wife Helen and three kids. John's mother also lived with them. In November 1971, the List's neighbors grew concerned, as they had not seen anyone from the List household for almost a month. The children were absent at school, and the family had stopped attending church. Some people thought that they must be on vacation, but the lights were always on at the house. The neighbors decided to call the police. The front door to the house was locked, but the police managed to get in through an open window. The house seemed to be deserted. The temperature inside was almost as cold as it was outside. However, loud church music was playing in the house, which added to the mystery. The house smelled of rotting flesh. The smell was coming from the living room, where the police found four dead bodies. They were Helen List and her three children. All three were shot at point-blank range. The death of the eldest child, 15-year-old John Jr., stood out, as he was not shot only once, but ten times. Why did the murderer focus so much on him? The police noticed traces of blood leading to the kitchen. This means the victims were killed there and then moved to the living room. Paper bags full of bloody towels were also found in the kitchen, alongside a blood-soaked mop that the killer used to try to clean up the crime scene. Police found a fifth body, Alma List, on the third floor of the house. She had also been shot in the head. Two handguns and a letter addressed to the pastor of the family's church were discovered in John's room. The letter was written by John. The autopsy confirmed that the family was killed by the same guns found in the house. By the time the police found the bodies, they had been dead for around a month. John List's face had been cut out of all the family photos in the house. His car was found two days after the investigation began. It was parked near the International Airport, which was around 70 kilometers from the List residence. The parking ticket was dated November 19th. The officers doubted that List had taken a flight. The only thing they knew for sure was that wherever he was now, he had a one-month head start on the police. The crime shocked America. The hunt for John List became a priority for the authorities. His picture hung in every police station across the country for all to see. Time went on and John's whereabouts were still a mystery. It was impossible to imagine that not a single American police officer afterwards had encountered him. The conspiracy was pulled off so well that the police started to suspect that John List was no longer living. There was a theory that after murdering his family, John committed suicide in a location that cannot be found. After 18 years of searching and finding nothing, the detectives turned to journalists for help. At the time, the show America's Most Wanted was very popular. The police came up with an idea to do a piece on John List on the show, in the hopes that one of his neighbors would recognize and report him. The only problem was that the photo they had of John List was taken a year before the crime. There was no point in showing this photo, as he would look very different now. Nowadays, experts can generate dozens of images of what somebody might look like in 20 years' time in a matter of minutes. But back in 1989, the police had to enlist the help of the sculptor Frank Bender. He had worked with the police previously to sculpt the faces of people whose bodies had decomposed before the police found them. All he needed to reconstruct a face was the skull. This time the task was different. He had to model somebody's current appearance based off of a 20-year-old photograph. 
Frank approached this task very carefully. He said that he needed to know everything about John List. He even said that he needed to literally become one with him. A forensic psychologist was assigned to help him and draw up a psychological portrait of the killer. Through this collaboration, they were able to make a sculpture of what John may look like now. There was one detail they couldn't get the answer to, had John started to wear contact lenses. If not, what glasses did he wear now? The psychologist suspected that List would not be careful enough about his appearance to swap the glasses for contact lenses. He also thought that John would have changed the style of his glasses. He thought that List would want to appear more important than he really was. The psychologist decided to go with the glasses with a thin, dark frame. Now the bust was complete, and they handed it over to the journalists. The America's Most Wanted piece on John List aired on May 21st, 1989. The sculpture was so incredibly accurate that a Denver family immediately recognized their former neighbor, Bob Clark. They contacted the FBI straight away and told them everything they knew. Bob had recently moved to Richmond. It didn't take long to find him. An FBI agent walked into his office and asked simply, Are you Bob Clark? To which he replied, Yes. The agent then asked, Are you John List? And the man replied, No, I am Bob Clark. The fingerprints provided conclusive evidence that this man was indeed John List. He was arrested for the murder of his family 18 years after the crime. It was very surprising that the glasses John wore were exactly how the psychologist had imagined them to be. What led John to commit such a heinous crime? He was a very religious person, but his wife did not share his views. Helen started to skip church. After the birth of their third child in 1958, Helen developed a dependency on alcohol and antidepressants. She started seeing a psychiatrist instead of going to church. She spent more money than her husband earned and started to neglect the children. All of the family's responsibilities fell on John's shoulders. John's career was falling apart. He was let go because of a merger. He then got a job at Xerox. Despite their financial difficulties, Helen couldn't control her spending. To make matters worse, List noticed that his wife was paying attention to other men. In the end, he had to leave his job at Xerox. However, John was lucky enough to land a good job as a supervisor at the New Jersey City Bank in New Jersey. The family moved to Westfield and, with some help from John's mother to pay down the payment for the mortgage, they bought the house that they would die in, in 1965. Alma agreed to give John the money on the condition that she could live with them. Their luck turned bad again around a year later. The new era required a new set of skills. Due to problems at home, John couldn't adapt quickly enough to the new environment. He was fired from the bank. He could not tackle the problems that he was faced with. Mortgage, paying the bills, rising family expenses. Helen didn't take an interest in John's life. She just wanted to spend money. The children were growing up, and that only meant one thing. They needed to make more money. John couldn't bring himself to tell his family that he had been fired. He would leave home every morning and spend the day reading a book or a newspaper at the train station. He did this for almost six months, until he found a job in New York. However, this was not the end of his financial problems. Helen kept drinking and John tried to keep her happy by satiating her expensive taste. He started sleeping in another room to avoid her gaze and sarcastic remarks. List turned to God for answers and started praying even harder, but this didn't solve his problems. He felt like his life was falling apart. John became stricter with the children. He forced them to obey his rules, but they started to rebel, especially Patricia. She started dressing provocatively, became more independent, and developed an interest in the occult. List suspected that she was using drugs. 
her behavior did not align with her father's values. John started to believe that the devil was controlling his family, so he decided to take their lives while they were still pure and innocent. By the morning of November 9, 1971, his plan was ready. He made sure in advance that the mailman would not come to the house. He called the school to tell them that the family was going away for a while. John executed his wife first. He found her in the kitchen, sitting in front of the window. The bullet passed through the back of her head and shattered her jaw. Her lifeless body fell to the ground. John then went up to his mother's room on the third floor of the house. She asked him about the noise in the kitchen. His reply was a bullet to the head. John then dragged Helen's body into the main hall, leaving a trail of blood behind him. He tried to clean up the mess, but he gave up when he realized he was covered in blood from head to toe. John went into the master bedroom and then threw up in the ensuite bathroom. List left a bloody handprint on the toilet seat, which would be a useful clue for the forensics team. When he came to, he took a shower and changed his clothes. Now, all he had to do was wait. The phone rang suddenly. It was Patricia. She asked him to pick her up from school. This wasn't in John's plan, but at this point, he had no choice. Having come home from school with his daughter, he entered the house before her and hid behind the door. As soon as she closed the front door behind her, he shot her in the back of the head. He had to go back to school to pick up his youngest son, Freddy. Freddy suffered the same fate as soon as they got home. Now, only the eldest son, John Jr., was alive. List was waiting for him to come back from football practice, but he came home earlier than expected. Practice was either cancelled, or he skipped it. That's not so important. List didn't want his son to see the bodies. As soon as he closed the door, he had a gun in his face. He remained composed. He managed to grab his father's arm. John Sr. let off a couple of shots but hit the wall. It took him five shots to land a bullet in his son's neck. John Jr. fell to the ground, but was still alive. His father shot all the bullets he had left into him. The patriarch of the family knelt down before the body and said a prayer. He spent the night in the pool hall not far from the bodies. In the morning, John turned the thermostat all the way down, switched on all the lights, and put the radio on at full volume. He packed his things, got his money together, and set off to start a new life. John rented a trailer in a suburb of Denver. He changed his name to Robert Clark. He used a fake social security card and managed to get a job as a cook at a local hotel. He then became assistant manager and accountant. By 1975, the murderer felt confident enough to return to church. He joined the parish of St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Denver. The following year, he got his driver's license and bought a car. He used his car to drive out to the members of the church if they were sick. He brought them food and helped them out in various ways. After a while, Robert Clark was elected to the church financial committee. At this point, he was sure he would not be caught. Robert was ready to live a full life again. He started to take care of Dolores Miller. Dolores saw Robert as a gentle man with some sort of personal drama in his life. He told her that his wife died from cancer. He never showed any photos or anything else from his old life. They got married in 1985. Ironically, meeting Dolores was John's downfall. The woman who recognized his face on TV was Dolores' best friend. Dolores couldn't believe that her kind-natured husband, Bob Clark, could have been a cold-blooded killer. John's lawyers didn't see the point in denying what everyone knew to be true. The defense only tried to minimize the punishment. But the crimes were too extreme. John List was found guilty of five counts of murder and received five life sentences. He was in prison for 18 long years before dying in 2008 at the age of 82.